hey, I hope you're well. And I just wanted to extend out my loving appreciation for you and for your decision to engage with this moment with us. If it's your first time here, welcome to the Today Dreamer podcast. The show is more of a space that's created to allow you to explore what cultivating the practice of presence in your life looks and feels like so that we may be able to deepen the way that we participate in the emergent world and the emergent world story. So um, we're here in this moment together. So I'm going to invite you to take a deep breath with me to kind of pause and just kind of come into this space together, I guess, into this place beyond time and space where we can just be here for a moment with nowhere to go, nothing to do. So if you haven't already, feel free to gently close your eyes and as slow as you possibly can, inhale through your nose, taking your time with it and whenever it is that you may eventually reach the peak of the mountain, feel free to just pause and notice any subtleties of your ever unfolding experience in that space before releasing with grace on the way out. exhale, wherever that may be, there's a gentle invitation to slowly synchronize the opening of your eyes. You might like to imagine that it's the first time that you've ever opened your eyes and connect the space of presence with your eyes closed with this more open um, and visual, I guess, aspect or sense of being. Today's guest is Stephen Buhner, and I'm going to just run through his bio a little bit. Um, when I came across Stephen's work, I was quite taken aback because it He's kind of already written the book that I've been wanting to write for a while, although in his own kind of language. And he's just really, I just feel really connected with Stephen in the ways that he thinks and um, some of the ideas that he's shared. So, yeah, just kind of, just, yeah, really taken aback. And I felt really compelled to have a conversation with him and see if we could um, you know, see what emerged from that space out of curiosity and love, really. So, um, he is an earth poet philosopher. Stephen Harold Buner is the senior researcher for the Foundation for Gaian Studies. Described as bardic naturalist, he is the award-winning author of 19 books, including The Lost Language of Plants, The Secret Teaching of Plants, and Sacred Plant Medicine. His most recent book is Plant Intelligence and the Imaginal Realm. Before retiring from the road in 2013, he taught for more than 30 years throughout North America and Europe, and he now lives in Silver City, New Mexico. 
So uh, before we get into the chat with Stephen, if you are enjoying the show, please feel free to kind of get in touch and connect more deeply with myself and the community here. You can do that by sending an email, letting me know what you think. Um, any kind of questions or recommendations are always welcome. Um, you can also leave a comment or a review if you like. Um, don't feel pressured or forced, um, but that that's always a nice thing. Um, or just kind of maybe just tell a friend about the show. If you're getting something out of it, they might also, so that we can kind of spread this energy far and wide to anywhere anyone that may need to hear it. This conversation is going to be a two-part series. This is part one. There will be a part two. It's a longer form um, type that I'm experimenting with. So, yeah, hope you get into it and I hope you get something out of it. And I hope you can feel really into this one uh, with your heart rather than your mind. Let's get into this chat with Stephen. Well, um, the, the thing is, the stuff that I've been working on now is kind of gloomy. <laughs> so, okay. Yep. Because I've been working, the, my newest book is called Earth Grief. Yep. The journey into and through ecological loss. And while, you know, uh, I found a way to, I think, um, cycle the book in such a way that by the end, the reader was feeling uplifted, but not in a sort of false hope way. Um, mm. But it was dealing so much with the concept of grief and with, um, uh, you know, sort of the ecological realities that we're in that nobody really wants to look at. So that makes it a more gloomy kind of talk. Um, and I don't know if that's really where either of us really want to go. Um, uh, you know, when you mentioned insoling language a lot in your original emails, and I've sort of been um, orienting myself around that, and I play with that to some extent in Earth Grief, but uh, a big part of the early part of the book is looking at dissociated mentation, which has always been a, hmm. um, a part focus of mine because it's so incredibly common in the Western world, and especially in the United States. I mean, you know, the and the English, they sort of, you know, I was reading this great book by this English writer the other day, and he said, and this, he had this great line, we almost hugged, but fortunately at the last second, we both remembered we were English. <laughs> 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 Which I thought was great. You know, so there's that sort of reticence of emotional expression that... I think the Australians have, the, the Americans really have it, even though we're different than the English in that I would think, I would say we're much more, um, well, they would say we're much cruder, but we tend to be more um, physically expressive in a lot of different ways, but not necessarily all that more amenable to males um, engaging in recreational weeping, you know, or something like that that uh, we're, we tend to be focused more on the outward rather than the inward. So, you know, that whole thing is part of what I was looking at because I wanted to get away in that book from, you know, I read everything I could find on ecological anxiety and climate grief and all of that, and virtually every one of them was... <clears throat> They didn't want to feel the feelings, right? Mm. They wanted to redefine it so that if we do all of these things, we won't have to feel the grief anymore. So it was about descent into um, kind of ashes and loss, which given that you've lost your mother, you obviously, you know, unless you um, were totally a stranger or something, you've been dealing with some of that, I'm sure. So that's... Um, that sort of a thing, but, uh, and, uh, anyway. Yeah. I, I think with the, with the recent loss of mother, I've, I, it was a really interesting connection that came up through, you know, this ongoing process of, um, like a connection with the great mother as well. 
Yeah. And uh, I think a more deeper connection into that sense of grief as well, um, which was, yeah, it just kind of, it just hit me like a ton of bricks and, you know, across the face it, or across the heart even and, and all of right. a sudden as well. And right. yeah, it's it's been a, uh, an active exploration of mine as well. And you're right, it is quite a gloomy vibe um, in some respects, but there is yeah. there is this kind of strange, twisted beauty to it as well that I've been feeling, um, which is which is an interesting space as well that I've never really felt into. Um, how, how old are you? Thirty two this year. Ah, okay. So the most men don't like to feel grief and i'm it's certainly true of me because i found grief to be a passive emotion like anger like if i'm afraid that i can get angry and do stuff about it you know or if some pisses me off i've got all this energy or if i'm happy i've got all this energy but grief was yeah. just this thing that had to be felt until it sort of was had its way with me and then after a while, I found that it could start to move into more of a motive force, but it's an odd one. It's a very slow, um, deeper sort of movement. And it has to sort of, over a while, what happens is when the grief becomes integrated, because at first it's not, it's just this massive event that comes from outside that we feel... And it's sort of, I mean, serious grief, it just really takes over the self. You you can't really do much. It's like being in the middle of a hurricane or something. And mm. um, um, the closer that the, the thing you've lost is to your essential heart, to your self-identity, the more difficult the grief is, the more overpowering it is when it hits. And over time it begins to integrate but it takes a while and once severe grief is fully integrated then it's sort of there with joy and anger and fear and all of the other sort of primary emotions but it never really goes away after that and it sort of leavens the tendency toward um, grandiosity or the tendency toward you know, um, ascent, like going up and finding the light, no, we're all high and this is this wonderful mm. kind of stuff. Mm. Because it brings you, like Robert Bly had this great line that I've been thinking about a lot lately. He said, uh, wherever there's water, there's someone drowning. Mm. It's a great line. And that's exactly what grief does. Like to most people, if I say, oh, there's water, they're going to make up generally a lot of positive stuff. They'll have positive associations like swimming or, you know, drinking cool water on a hot day or the way that the ocean looks in the sun or something. But then that juxtaposition, you go from that sort of immediate um, associational thing that happens to there's somebody drowning then you sort of start to get the integration of what grief really means when it's fully embodied with everything else because there really isn't anything that is solely um, the light or solely wonderful. And so when you get that integration, what starts to happen is a certain kind of a gravitas, you know, which has the same root as gravity and grave that there's this deepening part and you know, I've been thinking about wisdom for 20 or 30 years now and it seems to me that wisdom can only emerge from that particular soil and it does but wisdom tends to be um, a bit quieter than you know it's a slower quieter deeper um, thing than excited um, happiness, you might say, or, hap or excited youth. So those are kind of the things I've been working with, in part just because of my own illness, which is rather serious and mm. um, is not <laughs> it's not going to go away. So, you know, it shifts frame of reference considerably because I'm not living in forward time anymore. I'm living in ending time, and that's a whole other thing. Most of us are 
immersed in forward time most of our lives. We're creating and building and going towards something. But then when you get to the end of life, it's a whole different orientation. And um, so it flips everything in this really unusual way. And because of the way our cultures are now, we don't have a lot of uh, skill base um, about that. Um, you know, I was the generation before me, I was born in 52. When people died, they died in their bedroom upstairs and they were born in their bedroom upstairs. And when they died, the women would wash the body and then they would, you know, the men would put it in the coffin and then they'd set the coffin in the, you know, in the front room by the fireplace and then they'd bury them in the, the family plot or the local cemetery. And it was all very interactive, you might say that way. Um, but people don't have a lot of exposure to that anymore, which is one of the reasons I think that the ecological grief and anxiety people are feeling is so much more difficult because they're not used to that kind of cycle of life anymore. Mm. Are you? Yeah. I, would you be open to speaking to kind of the texture of experience from transitioning um in the modes of time that you that you mentioned and you know how that how that may relate to kind of what we're going through on a collective level well say it say it more say it a little differently so i can make sure i'm getting what you mean yeah so you mentioned that you were you know at one stage of your life it's all about kind of seeing time as being this forward movement and then right. once you kind of kind of ex- moved into the process of acceptance with the illness that you have it's it's kind of switched a little bit and and that and the switching or the transitioning from those two modes is what i'm pointing to i guess uh yeah well that that's certainly let's start with something more fun <laughs> <laughs> and then we can get to that i mean i don't mind talking about it because it's something I've been working with in pretty deep contemplation the last eight or nine years. So we can definitely go fun. I was just kind of following yeah. the, the general yeah, more than kind of drift. To do that. Yeah. It's just, uh, and, and now that we've talked a little about it, you can get a kind of sense of how I'm working with it. And, uh, yeah, but, um, so, you know, my, my work has all been about sort of this journey of, uh, of, uh, I'm kind of like a, a psychonaut, you know, I like these explorations of state of being and mind and heart and mm-hmm. engaging with the world as fully as possible with all of my senses. And that, of course, includes language very much for me. So, yeah. Yeah, I I feel the same way. And it's interesting, I guess, just kind of looking at... The- I kind of see something emerging and I'm not quite sure if um, I'm, I'm giving it kind of the, I don't know what the word would be, but if I'm wrapping the right words around it, but there seems to be this sense of um, possibly like uh, going back deeper into nature as a contrast to kind of going deeper into the kind of technological metaverse. Right. And um, it seems like both things are kind of happening at the same time. Um, in this kind of, um, I'm not sure about equal way, but it just seems that way. And I'm feeling into kind of the link between uh, coming into, back into the senses and kind of reigniting the sense of aliveness amongst this kind of shift. And um, I mean, when you speak about uh, the kind of resonance of the heart and this feeling capacity, um, when I've written about it and thought about it, it's always in terms of vibes or um, kind of translating that into some sort of modern language or there's an attempt to do that. And the different, even like gloominess would be kind of one type of vibe. So very much looking at it through that lens, I guess, maybe there's a bit more fun in that area. That's a great place to start somewhere along there. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, 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 does anything come up for you in that area? Is it, does it kind of, it's, oh, yeah, it's totally. kind of open that's exploration. My, that's, that's my work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is the movement from dissociated mind to engage sensory experience. And in particular, um, 
the response of the heart to what's presented to the senses that um, because we all have that if I stand too close to you you will know that I'm in your space but mm -hmm. nobody's really spent any time like kind of analyzing what that is and really what it is is you've got that a field around you and that if I get into it um, it starts feeling funny you mm -hmm. know it's like uh, I don't have to even touch you it's just it starts to feel odd and it's because you have a sensory field that extends out from your body that can feel the touch of the world upon it. And in, you know, indigenous or, you know, ancient cultures, they could extend that field out very, very far. Um, and that was a big part of the way that they moved to, through the geography of, of, uh, of the world, um, because every thing they encountered has a sort of a unique vibe to use these more current terms but um, as Goethe said an intimation of mood or feeling to it or as Tim LeDuc this great writer up in Canada says it has a climate of mind mm -hmm. and so the climate of mind we have inside us is what leads to the climate out there that surrounds us and that is a uh, whole is becoming the climate of earth and unfortunately um so yeah we're we're kind of in this conflicted place about the two paths in front of our species and i think you know, most people are confronted with that path choice as well um and it's uh the civilizational structure is urging us to take one one particular path and for whatever reason there's something in a lot of people that's saying that it just doesn't feel right to do that there's some you know a lot of them say there's got to be something else something better than that yeah and so. So this idea of kind of the path to kind of allowing our sensory perceptions to to move more into our kind of or, or kind of blend more into the kind of thinking realm or thinking from a different space right. and um, even just taking that a couple of steps maybe prior it, for me it seems like it coming into a sense of presence or, or, or quietness even and and kind of um, getting back to basics on some level in terms of um, you know the ability to kind of listen to what that that may be or to um, hear what what may be kind of called for us or which way we're going in which direction. Um, and it seems like there's certain things that maybe dull, dull the, the trajectory of, of, of the potential or the potentiality of that, uh, like certain distractions or moving deeper into the, into that kind of technological realm. It's, it, this is just how it seems to me. And yeah, it seems like that to a lot of people. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, is there anything, um, I'm trying to feel into kind of where to question around this because, I mean, there's some obvious things about that path that I'd, I'd be curious to know if you found any kind of intricacies or interesting findings that are um, maybe not so obvious. Um, and yeah, just to kind of, I don't know, I'm trying to feel into this space right now. Well, that's a good thing to explore in our talk. Yeah. And all we have to do is start with, um, that particular thing. I mean, you're basically, all of my teaching and my writing has been focused on, um, so basically Descartes, who I never really liked much. And when I was, you know, 17, 18, I took a class, philosophy class, and they said, you know, Descartes cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Mm. And everybody's like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, that makes sense. And I thought, yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. And so I actually thought about it, really contemplated it deeply for a little over a year. And then I finally decided, no, I, I don't exist because I think, I exist because I feel, which would be sentio ergo sum. And that, and actually sentio, to be sentient actually means to feel. It doesn't mean to have consciousness or to think it means to feel. So in a sense, the people that are extreme rationalists who 
want to dissociate from their feeling self to be objective are basically making themselves insentient. They're losing their sentience, you know, which I think is a hilarious way to put it. And, you know, I was doing that today with some people that got all offended. <laughs> you know, I said, well, it's a, I think it's funny. And they go, no, it's not. You know, you're just, you're saying I'm not conscious. So I was like, well, not really. <laughs> so, mm. But I have a weird sense of humor anyway. So, mm. but it's that kind of distinction that's been present in my work from the beginning, the the path of feeling and in this particular sense that I speak of it and uh, re-inhabiting the, um, my inner being with the world that way, basically. Yeah. What, what, what role does, oh, this is this coming up for me, like what role does kind of motivation um, play in all of this? Because I, I know that there can be kind of an understanding from an intellectual level of what's going on without that being a strong felt sense and that kind of numbness, I guess, of the heart can be, uh, I know, like just I've, I've experienced that myself at times where it's like, you know, I'd love to be more open, but I'm just not, I'm just not there in this moment. And I guess... Well, I'm not talking about being open. It can involve being open, but that's not what I'm, I'm really talking about. It's a, it's a sensory experience like smell or like vision or hearing. And it, you can do a lot of things with it, like you can with vision. You can focus it down to a little tiny thing or expand it out to a more broad view. Um, so, but for me, it always started with, it started with one question, which is, how do I feel? You know? And, but, I, but I changed that because it was too easy to get confused, like, oh, I feel sad, you know, which is not really what I, where I meant to go with it. So I would say, how does it feel? How does this room feel? You know, do, and, and, you know, when I'm in this room, am I happy? You know, and do I like it? You know, and so I began to be orienting myself because I noticed when I was around certain uh, kind of, if there was a high level of aestheticness to where I was, I felt better. I breathed better. I, I, I was happier. So that was kind of the golden thread that I began to follow. There's something in this thing that feels a certain way to that sensing part of me that feels good. And there's certain things in these other things that it doesn't feel good. There's some, there's an absence of this quality that um, I'm seeking. And so in the beginning, it was very rudimentary. I mean, I was, you know, I left home at 16. I didn't know anything except for, you know, I didn't want to end up like my parents. So it's like, yeah, okay. So I just started following that thing. So you might say, and probably back then I was using vibe or energy or this thing has good energy. Mm. You know? And I would follow that thing and try to get more of it. But I didn't have, that part of me had not been trained in uh, its ability to discriminate with great sensitivity yet. I was sort of reclaiming a, a capacity that had become atrophied. Um and that certain uh, people that are in certain artistic different fields, whether it's music or painting or writing or whatever, have reclaimed that sense, uh, but certainly not all of them. And uh, so it was following that thing um, and the decision to not be, end up in a kind of a wooden life like my parents. Yeah. Um, and you I know, feel like that, that's that what I was, motivation. that was, that was kind of what I was pointing to with the idea of openness was this, was this kind of, uh, maybe it was more of a willingness or maybe it wasn't any choice at all. And it was just kind of the natural progression that flowed on from your kind of, you know, your experience at the time. But it was like, th there seems to be a, a, there seems to be maybe possibly a, a choice point there of, you know, I'm going to follow this feeling. I'm going to kind of see where this leads because, it it's quite often quite a scary thing to do because it doesn't make sense to the the function that you've been using to make sense for most of your life. That's correct, and and also most people won't understand what you're doing. Yeah, and so it's you 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 
know, I refer to it as leaving the house that rationality built mm-hmm. and opening the door and walking out on the porch and then heading off cross country. Mm-hmm. And it's very much like our ancestors moving to, you know, North America or Australia, you know, 200 years ago or whenever, and just, you know, when people came here in the 1500s, there were no roads or, or paths or anything. <laughs> they just said, oh, I'll just set off, you know. And what an amazing kind of idea that is, mm. you know. And uh, this is like doing that in a similar way, but the, uh, the landscape is uh, more invisible, you might say. And is there more to the training process that you've discovered rather than just taking that leap over and over again and kind of, you know, um, moving into it um, more and more over time? Is there, is there, is there anything else that that you could point to in terms of this training that you mentioned? Well, it's training the discriminatory sense, like, okay, I like this clay pot, but I don't like that clay pot. Mm. Why? You know, why okay. do I have that feeling toward this one and that one? Have you, have you started the recording yet? Uh, yeah, it's been recording from the beginning, <laughs> but I can cut out anything you don't want to talk about. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, where are we in this whole process? I don't yeah, know yeah. I but still anyway, don't know okay. what's going on, you know? <laughs> I'm glad you did. So anyway, um, okay, so let me tell you this story. Okay, so there's these three guys, and I've written it out in a huge amount of detail in one of the books I'm working on now. But there's these three guys up in Canada, and they decided, just because they were young and they had the time, that they were going to build a canoe in the old way, you know, the way indigenous people did in Canada long before them. And so they did. They spent a long time building a birch bark canoe and, you know, using pine tar to seal the joints. and, And they carved all of the wooden struts and everything and made the paddles by hand and then it was a pretty big canoe it was three of them and they're gonna they're gonna sail all the way they're gonna will paddle all the way across canada okay and it's going to take them a whole year so anyway they spend months making the canoe and then then when spring comes they start on the east coast and i you know i have traced out the whole pathway which i don't remember and they, um, you know, so then they set off and then they make it about halfway and they have to spend the winter there. And then they have all kinds of adventures like falling in and, you know, getting sick because, you know, one of the guys made the soup. Or actually, one of the guys made the coffee in the pot. They'd had fish head stew in the night before they didn't wash it very well, you know. So all these different kinds of adventures. And they, they go across the whole thing and all these amazing adventures happen to them. And then they get to the other side of Canada and they actually go up north and they come out into this this sea, you know. And they they were so close, they just kept going. And so they come up and it's dark and the there's no lights anywhere because they're very far from any kind of cities or anything. And they come out and the, you know, the northern lights are just filling the heavens with all of the colors that only the northern lights know. And then the Milky Way is this huge spread across the sky. And the sea is just as, as clear as glass. It's just silent, unmoving. And so all of the heavens are reflected in the sea and the men are deep in reflection to these young men and so they they were telling they told this story to a, a teacher that i went to hear talk once and she tells the story and then she says uh, and so i asked them what was it like and the guy says wow man it was totally intense and then she looks at us and she goes one of the great experiences of humankind lost from an inability to articulate. Yeah, yeah. I was just, oh, I was, yeah. It's interesting <laughs> that you kind of you're pointing to that. It's like, even, even when we try to it, it, it kind of diminishes. Because like, I notice this when I've been traveling. Like I've I've set out on these these kind of journeys in different ways, and I come back and 
on my initial trips, I've wanted to kind of share all these kind of cool and funny stories with friends because I remember thinking, you know, it might make, help me sound cool or they might be able to get an idea of, you know, all the right. crazy things I did. And I got back and, you know, said all these things to people and they just blank faces. Like it was nothing like the experience. And then I gradually began to realize that, you know, I'm not going to share the stories. Like I got back from my last trip, which was the longest one I've ever had. And I just didn't even say a word to anyone, you know, because it some things maintained, I think. And I think almost um, now that I'm thinking or feeling into it, absorbed into my being that I can maybe share in, in, a, in, in the way that I walk through the earth rather than through transforming it into language, if that makes sense. It does. And, and for me, though, the real point of that, because when I, you know, when I left home and uh, from Dallas, Texas, a horrible place to be, <laughs> 16, mm. 1968, and I hitchhiked to Berkeley, California, and it, the 60s were going strong, and I happened to end up in a sharing a flat with a bunch of interesting, weird people, one of them, <laughs> a, a guy that had just finished his master's degree doing studies on LSD, and of course, he and all of his friends in the program took a lot of it themselves, you know, and mm. so... But he was uh, really into this whole idea of becoming articulate. Mm. And um, it sort of just was something that stuck in my head, you know. And then I began to realize as I went on later and I tried to describe things to people that they just weren't getting it. And that's when I really started focusing more as time went on on language and the ability to capture these invisibles that had this these very strong feelings to capture them in language so you feel this kind of friction almost on your skin mm. when you know you you hear the story or that you're moved by it you know and in and, and most of my books I try to have some stories like that in there, you know, and in my book on language and um, how to, that I really talk about how to capture invisibles in languages and souling language is the name of the book. You know, there's a number of those stories in there about that where just these sort of amazing, ordinary days, I mean, they're just a regular day, but these sort of amazing things happen seemingly out of the blue and it takes a certain amount of pacing and a certain amount of pauses silences are important but more than anything it's talking about these kind of experiences that are really common to people but that we never really talk much about them like um, you know, the basic place I always start is because this is an experience and pretty much everybody's had. It doesn't matter where in the world they're from. But, you know, a friend says, hey, let's go. You heard about that new restaurant? Let's go and eat there. You go, okay. And so you go out for lunch or dinner or whatever. And you walk in the door and then both of you kind of stop and go, now oh, this place feels funny. <laughs> uh, you know, let's go someplace else. Okay, but that that's the feeling sense that I'm talking about. We're extremely, we have a, a very ancient, very potent, evolutionarily developed um, capacity to perceive the meaning of things. Uh, you know, and it's that felt, we feel it that way. I'm sure most people have had the experience of seeing a car drive down their street and then something feels a little scary about it. You go, ah, I don't know about the people in that car, you know, or, or when a, a little puppy walks into the room but hasn't seen you yet and you're looking at the puppy and you're just sort of caught up in that puppiness. They're so involved and so cute and just their nose is just so focused on the carpet or whatever. And then you go, here, boy, and the puppy looks up and you just feel this sort of exchange of energy that goes back and forth between you and the puppy bounds over and you pick it up and you're both so happy to be but see that moment of exchange everybody knows about that you have it with people you love with your girlfriend or your boyfriend you have it with your pets 
And you can even have it with a great tree or a great stone formation when you're walking in the woods and you come unexpectedly on them, you know, but we don't have a word for that in the language or we don't have a word for this sort of ability to feel the mood of things, um, the feeling tone that all, everything that around us possesses. Mm. And so that, you know, it took me, so I've been hunting words for, oh, decades and decades. And it was when I read James Hillman's uh, The Soul's Code that I came across, uh, you know, the word esthesis, which was an ancient Athenian term for like that moment of exchange with the puppy where some soul essence leaves my body and goes to the puppy and some soul essence leaves the puppy and, and comes over to me and we both breathe it in. There's always this moment of like, inspiration and the Athenians all said that inspiration comes from the environment not from inside ourselves and as that exchange we breathe it in and then something in the puppy goes inside me something from me goes inside the puppy and there's a special kind of intimacy that occurs and that can happen with any thing really in the world around us but that's one that almost everybody has had an experience of. So I point, I can point these things out and people go, oh yeah, so it doesn't have to be a, you know, kind of a grandiose thing or a, you know, or so you needing archaic or strange language even, you know, or, you know, some sort of technical language that people with PhDs make up. It's just these common things that we do that, but that sensing that we have is uh, we don't we don't talk about it, and it's that that thing where I think it was Wittgenstein that said those things that we do not have language for we pass over in silence, and we spend a lot of our time having depths and richness of experience that we never develop because we don't have a way to talk about it. Yeah. This is this is really exciting me because I I guess I'm kind of at around um, well I feel really connected to that point that you mentioned when you started kind of exploring this kind of poetic vibe and the reason for it and that's only that's almost exactly what I'm where I'm at in this moment and it's only kind of a new space of exploration for me and I'm I've got this wondering around um, you know once that exploration began was there a change in the kind of frequency or potency of these of, of these moments or 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 in the way that you were presencing them um oh sure yeah and what did that what was the texture of that change is was my curiosity well it's <laughs> it's interesting so um you know you have to understand that even if it's not conscious there's a reason why the aesthetic sensibility in people has been atrophied mm. okay so because so just think about school i didn't i didn't fit in school really well i'm kind of like on the asperger spectrum somewhere you know um moderately functional but it took me a long time you know a lot of social cues i just don't get I had to learn about a lot of them, and some of them still don't make any sense to me. I, you know, mm -hmm. I have this horrible habit of saying, you know, things out loud to everybody. It's like, no, no, yeah, you know, we don't talk like that here. So, but anyway, um, <laughs> the thing is, you know, sitting in school, the rooms don't have any aesthetic dimension. Mm -hmm. They're just a square box, and the chairs don't really have an aesthetic dimension, and. There's nothing really rich about them, and they're all like this real practical kind of corporate thing, you know. And, you know, the I've started to extend the word brutalism in a lot of directions that it's probably not meant to go, but there was this architectural style that started coming in after World War II in the 50s and 60s called brutalism, and it's the, you know, the big cement buildings that they make you know so there's no not even any plaster on them you know they're just like brutal and it was sort of soviet architecture but a lot of the americans got into it and it's just become sort of a national style and then a lot of the houses which in the 30s even and even in the 40s there was a lot of aesthetic detail to them here 
they just started becoming more square boxes because you get more uh, room area and it doesn't cost as much money and everything's just you know nice and square and white walls and everything and there's so we start being sort of surrounded by this particular um, mindset you know it's got the house has its own climate of mind I'm sure that's another thing that people know but you know and they might mention it but if you walk into a house that feels really rich and warm like a home and really loving mm. you can tell as soon as you walk in and if you walk in one that feels kind of cold and distant you feel that too so then then the question is okay what's the difference and so i went through this long period of time where i began to replace everything that i owned with something that had um, more of that aesthetic feeling to it so that when i looked at it i would have that sense of like uh, richness or depth or like a home that felt loving you know whatever my that was drawing me to those things and so i began to surround myself more and more with only those things and it took a long time but the more i did that the more that quality of perception and my ability to distinguish was developed so then i could start to maybe articulate more about why and a huge element of it is the amount of love that people put that the artisans put into the thing they make because they're talking to the material all the time they're loving the material they're shaping it it's just as if they're being spending time with their beloved this person that they love and the two things together sort of the material that's being loved and the person something more than the sum of the parts comes into being hmm. so um i'm sure pretty much everybody's been in buildings that seem to have a really massive aesthetic depth to them and like there's certain zen temples i've been into that were they were built by japanese artisans in the old way and those things are alive from the moment that they're finished because they're spending all of this time talking to the wood, loving the wood, finding a certain form in the wood grain itself and urging that line to come more into prominence because there's this whole communication dynamic that occurs. And I've spent much of my life working with wood in that way. Some of my first teachers were um, men who looked really rough to the eye but had this deep poetic sensibility about the shaping of wood and um, the things that they would create while they did that. And um, so they sort of initiated me into that sort of way of being. And, um, <clears throat> and that concept of putting eros or love into the work that we do it's very much in disfavor now because it takes longer and it takes a kind of focus of heart and mind that people aren't aware is uh, possible or even wanted or needed or, or anything anymore. They're not, it's not requested of most people. Usually it's artists <laughs> that want to do it and they, they insist on it, you know, much to their family's dismay quite often. But like even in music, see music, Musical notes are, each musical note is filled with, it has a meaning in it, right? We maybe can't say what it is, but when we feel a musical note, there's definitely some sort of a feeling tone, emotional tone that we pick up. And then when the notes are, are put all together, when it's composed, there's a communication that occurs. And one um, classical composer I heard talk about it. He goes, look, if, if we could say it in words, we'd use words. But there's states of experience and feeling and being that human beings have that, that can't be captured in words. Only music can do it. Yeah. But it can also be captured, you see, in the way a great potter throws a pot. You mean, th you mean throw as in 
<laughs> smashes uh, yeah, or... yeah that's the, the technical term for making the pot yeah okay <laughs> yeah. okay yeah yeah so and that's and when great craftsmen work with wood to shape these things you feel this something you're encountering something alive yeah just as you do when you experience great music so that's the thing you see that i've been following ever since i was young that living thing to understand its nature to surround myself by it to learn how to do it myself and in the process of that i became more alive you know um robert bly had this great image he's one of my great mentors mm -hmm. said you know when we're born we're 360 degree personalities radiating out energy in all directions and then as we start to be civilized and domesticated, you know, we start cutting off parts of ourselves. You know, you know, our mother says, oh, it's not nice to try and kill your brother. So, yeah, we put the, the part of us that you know, has five in this long bag of shadow mm. very behind us. So they say, oh, don't be ugly. So we put a part of ourselves we think is ugly in there. And, you know, pretty soon we're down to just this one little sliver of self that's left. And, you know, that I noticed that in my parents. And a lot of the adults that I knew when I was young, they looked like somebody just beat the hell out of them, you know. And I thought, you know, I don't really want to learn whatever it is they learned. <laughs> it doesn't look like it's any fun. I think I want to do something else. And so, you know, even though I didn't think about it that way, I was figuring out how to reclaim that 360-degree personality to have that sort of, um, aesthetic depth um, be alive inside me and the more I focused on it out there the more I tried to do it in language or with wood or with when I would teach it was more of a performance art to me rather than just a talk then the more I did that the more it seemed to come alive in me the uh, surface of my body became much more um, aesthetically attuned and the, the quality of my thoughts shifted and um, then it just started becoming this quite amazing adventure all the time yeah I what's coming up for me is this kind of this continual um, I would say opportunity to practice or challenge in some way of that meeting um, the way you know the the way in which you've been brought up that the you know the tension point between um the reopening and um the way the habitual energy has been formed and yeah. the kind of continual kind of having to step into that space and and the difficulty of that and the and the and the, yeah how scary that can be because and then also the unexpected um delights and gifts or surprises that arise from continuing to show up and trusting into that space uh, um i don't know that's just something that's yeah, emerging see, it's like as soon as we start school we start being trained out of that right so uh, by the time we get to the point you know we haven't we didn't really have a vote unless we were decided to be really a pain in the ass when we were six or seven and some people do but i didn't i just became this kind of wooden yeah sure whatever kind of guy and uh, shut down and very unaware but you know and then i my head was filled with all this junk i mean uh, they pretty much spent you know the first 16 years of my life teaching me all this nonsense and i've been spending the rest of my life trying to get rid of most of it because it's not accurate to the real world, you know? And so, like one of the main things that happens, for instance, is little kids will sit in their yard and talk to plants and trees or ants. They're pretty, uh, children are animists, mm. you know, from the beginning. They also don't like wearing clothes very much you know they have to be really trained you know to wear clothes you know and after a while they sort of get the concept of like oh there's something wrong with my naked body i better call you know cover it up you know and that that kind of goes no place good over time but you know then the other thing that happens is you know they start talking about how 
the trees are alive and have feelings or the flowers and they're pretty much told uh, pretty insistently that no they don't that's just stuff you know it's not alive like we're alive and so things begin to constrict down considerably but artisans know anyone that works in the deep way I'm talking about they know that what they're working with is alive that it exerts pressure and that it it uh, would see wood if you're working with wood in that way the wood wants to be something and it doesn't want you to make it something it's not it'll have a certain direction that it urges you to move and to go as you're shaping it into form and the same with language almost all writers that are decent writer, real writers rather than typists, of which there are too many, they will tell you that they'll start writing a book and the book will sort of take over and begin to go where it needs to go because it's like, it's as if story lives someplace else when it's not being told. There's some, you know, world or dimension or place that stories live when they're resting and when, as a writer, you begin to reach for story and you begin writing it, it it starts to insist after a while about how it's going to be written. Now, this thing sounds odd to a lot of people. Some writers, typists, <laughs> actually argue about that. They don't, they don't agree with that. But uh, the majority of writers actually do. So what they're getting to here is there's some sort of a, a force other than the human being that helps shape these things and uh, for me it comes from the material itself you know the the wood that i'm working with you know it, it will capture my attention in a certain way there'll be a a certain kind of knot or a line of grain that will suggest a certain direction and shape for whatever it is i'm beginning to make and the same thing happens with when I'm writing, I, you know, maybe I will get all build up a lot of energy and then I go and I sit down and I start writing and a lot of it's just typing, but there might be um, one line in there that just really is luminous, you know, mm. and that, that there's something more about it. And so I go back to that one because it seems to resonate more. It seems more alive. I feel almost a kind of a my mild goose bentley kind of a feeling and then I start to develop so and then that begins to take me on some sort of a, a journey it's what the poet William Stafford referred to as golden threads that this thing touches us and it's got this quality to it and if you have spent a long time training yourself to deepen your aesthetic sense and then you follow that thing then you, you you know it's a good thing it's some kind of a golden thing i think there's, the th there's something it. to be said about the, the the sense of it and then there's something else to be said about the following of it because i think yes. they seem like they're separate and 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 they are separate yeah there seems to be like well, that's a, a good point yeah and william stafford made the point he says you know the thing is you can't pull on the thread too hard, otherwise you'll break it and you'll lose your way. You have to, because only the oh, thread that's good. is going. Yeah, yeah. It's like a... And so mm. another way to look at that, because he was primarily a poet, so he wasn't caught in a, um, a you know, a scientific discipline or a, an academic discipline that he couldn't go out of, you see. Um, people that are in, have degrees, they're stuck in sort of a, a silo, um, and they're not supposed to go out of that. You know, if you're a, a chemist, you're not really supposed to spend time in archaeology, you know, or anthropology, you know, so they just sort of, they can't really see what's past the walls. But the interesting thing about Golden Threads, if you're not stuck in a silo like that, is that they connect apparently disparate things. You know, things that ap don't appear to have any connections with each other are in fact connected and that's why some of the um, the poets can do these amazing things because they're finding associations 
in language that have been lost, you know. And um, you're you're just kind of reading along, and all of a sudden you end up someplace else that you didn't really expect. You know, like uh, um, here's one of my short poems. I got in Machado did Anthony, Antonio Machado did a lot of really short mm-hmm. poems, and I got into that for a while. And one of mine is uh, because you know I, my whole life people have been talking about how they needed to find a place to belong and they just felt they didn't belong anywhere and you know some people want to go to heaven you know some people want to go to a commune and you know people have all different kinds of ideas but they're basically they they don't feel at home and I thought about this for you know years and years and finally I wrote this poem that goes like this it's very short there's one place in all the universe that's been made especially for you and it's inside your own feet sending a loving breeze of gratitude in your direction thank you so much for sharing space with us here and now and if you want some more information about our guest you can head over to todaydreamer.com and check it check out the episode section on the page Um, also If you're someone that's interested in deepening your practice of presence, if you want to work together with someone to structure a spiritual practice, whether it's an existing one or a new one, if you're looking to build consistency, define your ambition and recalibrate your trajectory in a way that's more in line with wholeness and in a way that contributes and participates more fully in the emergent world story and it's blossoming, then feel free to get in touch because I'm taking on a small handful of one-on-one clients, spiritual friends, um, and I'd love to speak to you. If you did enjoy this episode and you felt like you got something out of it, feel free to share it with your community. And if you feel like there's anyone in particular that could benefit from the space shared today, uh, I would really appreciate if you'd pass it on to them and I'm sure they would too. And yeah, uh, I'll catch you in the next episode. Thank you again, my friend, and be well.